Good morning, everybody. On behalf of Foundation for India, Indian Diaspora Studies, I would like to welcome all of you uh, for uh, this very important uh, timely session on uh, Indo-Americans' role in uh, US uh, 2022 elections. As we know that uh, uh, Indo-American community has reached to a significant uh, population. Uh, it uh, has a good presence in many of the swing states. Um, very prosperous uh, uh, community and uh, uh, getting involved into the politics. This uh, particular session is to have the discussion around uh, you know, what uh, role that uh, we have and how we uh, shape up the Indian diaspora to participate more actively into the you know, politics. I will hand over to Yogi Chug, uh, who is uh, uh, political analyst, uh, uh, strategist, uh, uh, himself uh, uh, was a uh, uh, Fremont City uh, Policy uh, Planning Commission, mem uh, Commission member. So I would let him continue handing over uh, Yogi Ji. Khandaraji, good morning, and everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, I'm here in California. And we have a panel of conversation points. This is a part of the Foundation for Indian Diaspora Studies series of conversations that we've been having over the last many, many months. And I applaud Khanda Raoji's uh, goal and objective along with Foundation of Indian Diaspora Studies to really have these meaningful dialogues. We are as good as the dialogue that happens within our communities. And as a part of this conversation, our goal is to certainly not only enhance and improve uh, the advocacy, uh, the engagement that is so vital in this um, American story of engagement of its immigrants and citizens living in this country. Um, I'm very proud of this conversation because this conversation is meaningful. It will be an opportunity for all of us to come back and understand how can we continue to have an effective voice. Um, if I can preface this conversation by starting off that the Indian American um, representation in this country is 4.5 million strong, uh, with a transformation from immigrants who are recently becoming citizens, but the impact of engagement and watching the political context in this country is such a vital part of who we are. Um, as we've been able to thrive in this country and we've been able to thrive in this economy and we become participants in America's uh, success. Um, I think having a seat at the table is not only an optimal consequence, it's a necessity. And over the years, many of the leaders in our community have always told us, be engaged, be involved. Um, and the best way to participate is to be informed. And often enough, these dialogues are what are needed. So I'm very happy to announce today that we have a very phenomenal panel of individuals who I believe will help participate in this dialogue and this discussion. And really what it comes down to is often Recording enough- Recording in progress. Recording in progress. Recording in progress. Often, um, we need to have people from varied backgrounds. Uh, today in the American political process, there happen to be two parties. I'm not sure if a third alternative will ever evolve, but till then, the Democrat and the Republicans uh, form the crux of our political ideology. Um, and that is really where we are. The two of our panelists that we have, the first one that I'm proud to introduce is Mr. Jason Berkovich. Um, he is currently a staffer for a congressman in the San Diego area. He understands politics and he is also a board member of the San Diego Anti-Defamation League. Um, our next speaker and next panelist will be Puneet Aluwalia. Benita is a Republican. Uh, he's also had the distinct privilege of having uh, worked for some of the most significant names in, um, in American Republican politics. He also works for the Livingston firm, and he has also been a individual who's been locally involved in his state Republican party, and many, many elected officials count upon him for his counsel. So once again, I welcome Jason and Puneet to this panel discussion today. Thank you. Um, let's begin this conversation, Jason. Certainly, um, I'd like to have the two panelists uh, talk a little bit about the very context of what this topic is about. 
Uh, this conversation is an ongoing conversation about the Indian American voice, uh, but the context of the 2022 elections are vital. Uh, in many states where you are located or your local municipalities, there will be primaries and then there'll be a general election. So as a part of that, Jason, if I may ask you to uh, begin this with just some brief introductory uh, comments, uh, followed by Puneet, and then we'll have some questions and answers on some specific questions that were articulated and combined as a part of the conversation amongst many of the FIDS members. Um, we'll incorporate that, and if anybody has any questions as well, if you can put them in the chat box. So, uh, Jason Berkovich, welcome to our Foundation of Indian Diaspora Studies panel discussion today. Excellent. Well, um, good morning. Namaste. Thank you, Yogi. Um, thank you to the Foundation for Indian Indian Diaspora Studies for having me here. Uh, first, just a little bit background on myself and, and why this is a topic that, that's always interests me and in particular connecting with the Indian American community. Um, so I actually grew up in Puerto Rico and I, and I lived in Puerto Rico until I was 16 years old. So where I grew up, I was the guy that looked different. Um, I, my mom was a computer programmer. My father was a professor and they were working quite a lot. And really it was me wandering around in the neighborhood and in the community and I stood out. So where I was raised, I was the one that stood out, but still eventually it all became my family. And as I was growing up, not only in Puerto Rico and growing up as a Puerto Rican, um, I always heard stories about my father who has traveled around the world um, doing studies. So he's a anthropologist and a biologist. So my father has lived in Africa. He's lived in Japan. He spent time in Southeast Asia and South Asia, um, South America. So I grew up hearing these stories about the world and the different cultures in the world, the different religions in the world, the different priorities in the world. And a lot of that upbringing being raised what I consider overseas, even though Puerto Rico is part of the United States, it is very different linguistically and culturally. So growing up overseas and hearing these stories always placed um, a serious importance in our lives of building those connections with other people and making sure that we understand where they're coming from. And my political activism and my work in politics is largely guided by that. It's that experience of being the person that looked differently in somewhat of a foreign land and also making sure that we spend the time to understand people from other backgrounds, other cultures, and other beliefs. Um, and that's what I'm looking forward to talk to you a little bit more about today is how that mindset impacts what I do in the context of the elections and why it's important for the community to get involved and ensure its voice is heard. Jason, thank you very much. Um, I think that helped articulate your own motivation and your own story of uh, triumphs and tribulations could be very helpful to this group that is uh, participating in this discussion today as well. Puneet, um, same opportunity for you as well. Thank you, thank you Yogi, and thank you Kandiraji for having me here. Uh, my activism began when I was successfully doing things in the United States, and the September 11th happened in 2001. And I realized that how suddenly um, a Sikh in Arizona was targeted for abusing Sodi. And I realized that what happened to the Sikhs in 84 riots, when you were targeted for looking odd and different, and you were killed and hacked uh, in the streets of Delhi, the capital of India, uh, that was a changing moment in my life then. I was young, impressionable. And same thing when I realized 2001 that anybody can be picked out and killed uh, just for the belief system. That made me realize that I have to be active and participate, but I did not know anything and understand how it was. And, and remember, remember folks, 20 years ago, we Indian Americans were there, but not in that big number, which we are today. So I joined the local county party and was active supporting candidates. Uh, in fact, I have to thank my good friend, Samuel Hotra, who helped me, uh, who's a great Republican, uh, helped me also understand little, uh, uh, the value system of the conservative Republican party. And I identified myself more than that. And that thus became my journey into the Republican politics 22 plus years ago. And I have really, really um, enjoyed this because not only I ran for office as Lieutenant Governor, but I understood what's important to be an American. Hence the reason when I ran for office, it was about being a proud American. I left the, uh, 
the Indian or the Sikh or part of who I am in my culture, but became a proud American. And that's what important. And that's what I think our conversation should be about is how do we actively participate? And as Yogi said very well, we have to have a seat on the table. We have to be informed. Uh, we have to make sure that we are uh, taking part in this democracy because folks, we are in a very different juncture in our country. We've seen from the coronavirus, we've seen uh, the impact of uh, war in Ukraine and how the justices are being impacted right now. And this community, which has CEOs, successful business people, all the way from uh, gas station owners to hotel owners to you name it, uh, we have a lot to lose. And, and, and we are not part of the Abrahamic faith. Uh, and that's the reason why it's important as proud Americans, as proud immigrants or first generation Americans to this great nation that we have to lead the path for our kids and actively participate in this process. And I am, I, I enjoy and I love politics and I, that's what I enjoy what I do. And that's the reason I do advocacy, not only on human rights, religious freedom, but also helping companies to be successful. How do they navigate and meander through the agencies and the political process? And that's the reason why I felt so when Yogi, who is my friend, I, I really respect him. He said, hey, Panik, I need you there. And I say to Yogi, tell me to jump and I'll tell you how high I can jump for you. So honored to be here and, and look forward to having a great conversation. And Jason, hey man, thank you for what you do. Uh, it's important. Uh, we may have a different ideological difference, but you know we agree to disagree. So let's move forward, sir. That's great, Puneet. Thank you very much. Um, both from Jason and Puneet's comments, what is evidently clear is that over the many, many years, there have been personal stories that have resulted in our own engagement. You know, our, our diaspora study as immigrants has done of that. We've been through some phases, right? The early um, immigrant journeys that happened in this country, uh, the first generation and opportunities and, and learn to thrive in a world in which it was an unknown world to them. Uh, like the story of many other immigrants, uh, we became comfortable. And that comfort led into a certain sense of security. And now that we have that sense of security, we recognize that involved in politics is so vital for our existence. Um, I'm reminded of the conversation that I had with once Congressman Barney Frank uh, at the Indian American Forum for Political Education's conference in Massachusetts. And what he shared with me at that time was he said, you know, you have to get involved, you have to be engaged. Democracy is not a spectator sport. It requires personal stories of engagement and people will come in from different directions. So I'm very keen to hear how we can transform the sense of, of desire to be involved in the political process and how's the right way to do it. So before we get into the conversations um, about this, I would like to take this opportunity to recognize some individuals who have joined us in this conversation today. We're truly honored to have uh, the presence of Professor Ved Nandaji. He is an extraordinary human being, has a mentor to us and has led the path of really helping us understand that how do you come back and, and really become good participants in the greatness of America. So Professor Nandaji, thank you for everything you've done for us, our community and will continue to do. Um, Dr. Nandaji, would you like to say a few comments before we get neck deep into this conversation? But thank you very much, Yogi Ji. Uh, I think uh, both of our participants, um, they have uh, distinguished careers and their own personal stories are compelling and convincing. And I think uh, our own community that has played a very active part in the both in their state, nationally, I think the time has come that they also have visibility in the political arena because uh, many of them have not been active in politics. And so thank you very much, Khandirawji. Thank you, Chukji, for starting this conversation, an important conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nandaji. Um... I would like to also um, acknowledge the presence of um, Professor Vinakarji, um, Professor Sunil Kumarji, um, and then also um, uh, Praveen Sinaji. And also I'd like to take this opportunity to also acknowledge uh, one of our Silicon Valley 
um, legendary people. Uh, she has been just a phenomenal, phenomenal person, um, nurturing both entrepreneurship, but at the same time will be referred to as one of the greatest individuals that Silicon Valley has seen, a former CEO of a company that was the first to be taken public by a woman. Uh, Vidita Guptaji, namaskar, and welcome to our discussion today as well. Um, Kandaraji, this conversation has been one that we've done. We've set up the conversation. Before that, I think it would be appropriate just for all of our participants to get a little sense of what Foundation of Indian Diaspora Studies is. We have a very brief video that we would like to share. So um, whoever is running the logistics for us, if they can just quickly run the Foundation of Indian Diaspora Studies video, I think it'll, it'll lay the network of some of why we're having these conversations. Uh, somebody on the technical team, there we go, great. Excuse me, um, there is no audio coming. The FIDS experts yeah. one. Yeah. Professor Yash Patak and Professor... Yogiji, can we start it from the beginning, please? There's no audio. Sure. For India and Indian Diaspora Studies is a non profit organization with a mission to create awareness and provide advocacy on issues, events, and matters related to India and Indian diaspora with factual research conducted by scholars and experts. It is an institute for research, analysis, awareness, and advocacy on events, issues, and matters related to India and Indian diaspora. FIDS engages dialogues of international leaders and policymakers in India, international affairs, and Indo US relations. It also conducts policy studies, surveys, analysis, conferences, and publications for strategic awareness and education on policy matters to international leadership, policymakers, media, and masses. FITS has successfully hosted conferences on various topics ranging from international relations, trade, terrorism, Kashmir, human rights, and India diaspora. FITS engaged experts, elected officials, and officials in external ministries. It works on international relations like Indo-US relations, Indo-China relations, Indo-Israel relations, and Indo-Afghan relations. 
It has also hosted many international leaders, such as India's Defense Minister Rajnath Singh, India's ex-Finance Minister Arun Jaitley, State Minister Jayant Sinha, India's National Security Advisor Ajit Dova, as well as Congressman Ed Royce, Congressman Joe Crowley, and Congressman Elliot Engel. FIDS has conducted surveys on Indo-American youths on their identity, U.S. elections, NRI policies of government of India, and opinions on Indo-Americans on policies and elections in the United States. FIDS has published policy papers on India's Kashmir, CAA, plight of the Yazidis, and Indochina conflicts. FIDS is also engaged in various issues like incidents of intolerances against Indo-Americans immigration policies related to Indo-American technologists, and improper projections of Indic traditions and religions in the U.S. media. FIDS experts also keep watch on international terrorism and the situation in South China Sea. Vice Admiral Shekhar Sinha, Ambassador Virendra Gupta, Professor Vijay Ko, Professor Shanti Shri, and Captain Alok Bansal are part of FIDS Experts Board. Professor Yash Patak and Professor Vedananda are members of the Board of Advisors. Great, sorry, thank you uh, for that video. We apologize for the technical difficulties, but um, you know, I, I hope you all had an opportunity to get a glimpse of what the work for Foundation in Diaspora Studies is and how do we move forward? So we'll now step into this uh, conversation and for any of our participants, if you have any questions that you would like to address, um, it would be very helpful um, if you could put your questions in the chat session and we will absolutely uh, make every attempt to ensure those questions are posed to Jason and um, Puneet as well. So while those questions are coming up, Jason and Puneet, I'm gonna probably start this conversation by asking a question. In a world in which every elected official is opposed by people from differing viewpoints, um, how would you suggest that one go about articulating your specific position? And how does that specific position or positions then help outlay into building everlasting relationships irrespective of where the person's position may be. So Jason, let's start with you. Sure, so it's a great question. I think a good way to start the conversation. Um, the first thing that I would suggest when it comes to interacting with elected officials um, and Puneet being one could probably attest to this, it's good to show that you've done some research. I mean, we all do a job, elected officials all do a job. It's not an easy job. It requires a lot of time and energy and, and research and understanding and education. So it's good to show that you've done a little bit of research. And one easy way that you can do that is acknowledge what any elected official has done that you agree with. So what I generally recommend as a step one, anytime that you're going in to meet an elected official, let's say you have an ask of that elected official, you may have something that you're critical of that you disagree with, but it's important to acknowledge what have they done that you like. Um, so that's the first thing that I would suggest is doing some background research before any engagement so you can acknowledge something good that the elected official has done. The other thing which I think is really important is you should never agree with an elected official 100% of the time. If you agree with an elected official 100% of the time, you're probably not looking close enough or you're probably not listening close enough either. Um, but that's okay. It's okay to disagree. It's about how we disagree that is the important thing. And that's where when you're engaging, there are things that are gonna come up that you might disagree with, but it's important to maintain the dialogue. It's important to maintain a light and respect. And that's how you're able to build that relationship because ultimately there are all kinds of things that come up. There are foreign affairs issues that come up. There are domestic policy issues that come up. And the thing to keep in mind is that we should all be able to agree at least on a few things. And that's what we should work together on. If you disagree with somebody 95% of the time, that still means that you agree with them 5% of the time. So we have to change our mindset about those interactions. Like I said, do your research ahead of time, acknowledge the areas that you agree on, and make sure that you're maintaining a level of respect to ensure that you can dialogue. It should not be a lecture, it should be a dialogue. And think of it in terms of educating those elected officials that you're meeting with. 
Great. Jason, thank you. And Bonita, I'd like to ask you to chime in as well and give your perspective. Yogi, you're asking how do you build relationship with an uh, elected official? Is that your precise question? Um, th that is the question. And, and specifically, the question is how does this online, online dialogue happen even with those that may not agree with your positions? Okay. Well, <clears throat> we don't agree with ourselves when we're young and we keep changing. We don't agree with our spouse. So it's very hard to find a candidate who you could agree with everything on. As Jason said, you find the path of issues where you will be agreeable to that candidate. But before you do that, you have to ide ideologically identify yourself. Are you a Republican or a, or a Democrat? Because you see where you and I hail from, uh, it depends on the wind. If it's Congress party winning, everybody becomes a Congress. If BJP is winning, everybody becomes BJP. It's not an ideological mindset. And when you are fundamentally ideologically believe in small government, less red tape, less regulation, strong defense, strong foreign policy, um, you know, these are the fundamentals. If you agree with, then you know that you are on the side of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. And within that group, you will have, are you with the Freedom Caucus folks or are you with the moderate Republicans or you're based with a candidate based on the issue he or she will specifically take. And mind you, um, in the member of Congress, and Jason can attest to that because he works for one, the attention span of the member of Congress um, is maximum 15 to 30 seconds, then you've lost him because guess what? He has so many domestic issues, first issues that he has to take on within his district. And it's all about re-election because those, that re-election comes every two years. And the best way to be in the uh, create a relationship or build a relationship is go door knocking for that candidate, make phone calls for that candidate, write checks, tell your friends and family to go out if he has a primary, support him at every level, become part of his 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 grassroots team. And if not, if you just believe in writing checks, that's fine too. But if you want to build a relationship with a candidate, look, you have to realize one thing. You haven't gone to school or college or church or uh, <clears throat> or any place of common with them. So what's common is ideologically. And at the same time, how you support his larger picture of taking care of members of, of his district and most, most importantly, America. And that's how you, you identify if this candidate is one you can do it. And if you don't agree with that candidate, so be it. If he or she is your representative, you go to present somebody who you identify with. For example, in the 10th district, we have Demo uh, I'm now in the 11th, we have a, a, a Democratic congressman. I have nothing in common with him. And I know whatever he, whatever we say, he's gonna always vote on the party line. I, I'm sorry to say that's where the American politics is today. So I would rather go support a candidate in a different district who I'm ideologically much closer to. So I hope I answered your question. No, it does, Neet, and, and, and adjacent at least to this next conversation, you know, in the sense of our local communities, certainly I've been of the adage that all politics is local. And often enough, the most simplistic interactions that happen are with members of city councils, uh, school boards, uh, potentially board of supervisors, then state assembly, state senate, uh, United States Congress members, United States senators, and the holy grail of presidential politics. And, and, and there are different flavors of engagement. Some people like to engage at the local level. Some people like to engage at the um, national level. So it really comes down to this dogma of, okay, what is their partisan belief? Uh, which party philosophy do they subscribe to? And off late, a conversation that has really begun to happen is, how do you see the Indian American community's involvement in the national discourse? And then down to breaking down the community, we then begin to have silos of interests. How would you suggest um, that people begin their political involvement and engagement? And, and, you know, I've always felt that these candidates sometimes are relationships are valuable because they're eventually the ones who are going to go and occupy higher offices. Uh, so, Puneet, why don't we start with you and, and Jason, I'd like to chime in. De varying degrees of engagement at different levels. Is, I am a firm believer. I have been part of the Fairfax County now, a Republican committee, which is grassroots for close to 20 years, in and out, off and on. And I was first vice chair. Uh, in fact, here's the engagement. I, I, was, I was attending those meetings and then I understood how the party process works. So it's important if you want to be involved at some point in life, you want to run, 
understand the party process. That's very important because if you don't know the people, how they vote, who they vote, because within our party, uh, as in Republican and Democrat, within the Republican party, we have various factions. So you need to have those relationships built and it takes good 10, 15, 20 years to build those relationships. And once you have built those relationships, then you can choose to run for office and then maybe you go through that process of nomination and then you build a relationship. And I name ID is very important, but I would say if you have Republican uh, clubs, you have business groups, join them, participate in them, get to know the people, get to know the ones who are the, the movers and shakers of that uh, group. At the same time, support your members of Congress. And, I'm, and, 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 and Yogi said a very important thing, all politics is local. You, most of us say, oh, we want to influence presidential election. If you don't have $600 million or 10% of the $6 billion, don't even waste your time. Because focus on your, your, your state, your county, your district. If you can be anywhere from five or 10% of that, the total budget, then you're in play. Otherwise you're basically wasting your time and your money and the people you're asking people to give money to, 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 your, to, the, to cause you all believe it. Because US elections, be it now a delegate race is close to a million dollars. A supervisor race is close to 350 to half a million. And I'm talking about Northern Virginia here. Um, elections for Congress is anywhere from, you need for just a primary uh, $600,000 to $2 million. And you know, your California primaries are much more expensive than the Virginia primaries are. So this is a money game, guys. And, and, and if you are wealthy, and, and I'll give you another prime example. I was honored to be the, ch the chair for uh, Governor Youngkin, who got elected. Uh, I was a API chair for him. And to win the nomination process, he poured in $10 million of his own money. And he won the nomination. And what he did is he mobilized the grassroots. So folks, as I said, it's all about grassroots, getting to know your local county officials or the you know, Democratic side or the Republican side, whatever is your calling, you get involved. And that's how you participate. Get to know the business group, get to know the women group, get to know the college education group. And most importantly, write 50, 25, $100 checks because that goes a long way because that's how we win. That's great. Jason. Your I'll actually break it down into three different parts when it comes to getting involved politically to try to simplify it for everybody and, and it's um, make you see that it's really not that hard. It's, it's actually quite easy to get involved. So the first thing is, which is the biggest factor, jurisdiction. You've got to gain a better understanding and it's critical to have a, a better understanding of who handles what. So the matters that land under the purview of a member of Congress are significantly different than the matters that land under the purview of a city council member. If you're worried about the relationship between the United States and India, a city council member has almost no impact on that relationship. You might be able to set up a sister city at the more local level, but foreign policy is handled by the federal government. At the same time, if you're worried about um, are your streets being paved? Are you worried about the number of police officers being hired? The city council has a large role in that. Whereas Congress doesn't deal with local law enforcement. Congress has a minimal role in paving local infrastructure, although we're involved in like the interstate highways, but it's minimal impact on local infrastructure. So it's really important for you to know what do all these different elected officials handle? Because then when you have a concern, you know who to go with. I know that there's a concern that's increasing the community regarding what's being taught in schools and how are people learning about India? How are people learning about Indian Americans? Well, if it's your colleges, then in general, that lands under the state purview. You wanna to talk to your state elected officials. If it's high school or middle schools, then we have school boards or you have city councils that can be involved in that. So you need to know first who is really in charge of the oversight of the issue that's most important to you. That's number one. Number two, we have to start distinguishing that not everybody in the political parties are the same. We've got to stop this idea that all Republicans are the same and all Democrats are the same because it's just not true. The reality is there are massive differences between a Congresswoman Liz Cheney and a Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. And you can go look it up yourselves. Those two women do not agree on a lot of things 
They're both Republican women in Congress. There are massive differences between Senator Joe Manchin and Senator Bernie Sanders. They are both senators. Bernie Sanders is actually an independent, but he caucuses with the Democrats. Manchin is a Democrat. There are huge differences between those two. The idea that we can just paint with a broad brush, oh, he's a Democrat or she's a Democrat or he's a Republican, she's a Republican. We have to stop doing that because painting everybody with a broad brush only contributes to the most extreme elements of the parties because those are the ones that tend to be loudest. So we have to stop painting everybody with a broad brush. You should really get to know the individual candidates and individual elected officials themselves. Now, as Puneet said, yes, candidates are gonna be guided by overarching priorities of the different political parties. There are certain issues that, that we consider critical within the Democratic Party, just like within the Republican Party, there are certain morals and values that most candidates tend to align with. But we have to be careful about painting everybody with a broad brush. So you should really get to know the individual themselves because you might be surprised at how much you agree with them, even if they're in an opposing party. And the third one, run for office. Again, run for office. The, the easiest way to be represented is run for office. Jews in America represent about three to 5% of the United States or about three to 5% of Americans are Jewish. About 13% of elected officials are Jewish. Why is that? Well, because Jews run for office a lot. It's, in, it's critical. It's not about whether you're winning or losing anymore. Seriously, it's not about whether you win or lose. Simply running for office, you can move that dial. You can bring areas to the forefront that other candidates aren't necessarily talking about it. So I would really encourage you, even if you don't think you have a shot of winning, just by running for a school board, you can highlight the importance of talking about the Indian American community in middle school and high school. When you run for a state elected body, you can talk about the role the states play and what's talked about our colleges and university. Again, even if you don't win, you can run for Congress to talk about the relationship between the United States and India, to talk about what's going on in South Asia between Afghanistan and Pakistan and Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. So just running for office, you can bring the important issues within your community to the forefront and move that dial, even if you don't necessarily win. So don't be discouraged just because you don't think you're gonna win. You know, and Jason, I'd like to ask a question. Often enough, um, I've seen that we wanna make um, a conversation with the highest rank in the room. Um, can you help me understand the importance of staff members and how important their work is and how equally important it is that, you know, you may wanna be able to meet your member of Congress or your, your state senator probably get a meeting with them maybe once a year. But in the meantime, as somebody who's been a staff member yourself, Jason, do you find that it's important to build relationships with the staff members as well and helping them provide details and information on issues that you're advocating for? Or is it just getting lost in paper trail? Or what's the best way? Is breaking bread with many of these members of elected offices getting to know you? Does it make the advocacy a little easier, a little better? when they get to know you rather than the prism of a narrative that somebody else may have outlined on your behalf against you or for you? So it's a really great question. And I would say this depends. And this is why it's really important um, to get to know your elected officials and their staff members. So each elected official really has a, a I mean, it is, they are the elected official. So they control how much or how little say members of the staff might have. So it's important for you to get to know the staff and the elected official to see what that relationship is within the office. However, in some offices, for example, in our office with Congressman Scott Peters, each of us on the staff, we specialize in our own areas. The congressman, as Puneet brought up, he has hundreds, if not thousands of things that are going on at any given time. So we specialize in our given areas. And you should never be disappointed at a conversation with a staff member. It's amazing how many times I hear, oh, we're just meeting with the staff because the elected official is not available. That's the number one you, thing you can say if you don't want to get what you want. So I'll repeat that again. Ugh, we're just meeting with the staff. That's the number one thing you can say if you don't want to get what you're asking for. Because that attitude comes off in the meeting. The attitude comes off if you're trying to engage in a serious conversation with the staffer or if you're disappointed because the member couldn't be there. So you really want to engage. And then once you're engaging in that conversation, you can see, is, is this relationship gonna get somewhere or do I also wanna engage with the elected official? <clears throat> Even if the staff member has minimal say in a policy area, the staff member still has the ability to introduce you to the elected official is you happen to be at 
similar events around town. So I would say get to know the staff and how much of a say they have in the audience, get to know the elected official, and then you can react accordingly. In our office, I have a very big say, fortunately, in our foreign affairs portfolio. I'm one of the congressmen's foreign affairs policy advisors, and I've been fortunate to have a really good relationship with the local Indian American community because they've been able to educate me on the matters that come up of importance. It's not that we're always gonna agree, but it's a different perspective that I can consider when deciding whether to support or oppose any bill or support or oppose any legislation that's coming up. So it's important to build that relationship and understand the dynamics between the individual offices. Great, and, and Jason, before I bring Puneet on, um, I'd like to pose a question because this has often come up uh, in my own personal uh, dealings. I, I've been engaged with, with the elected official and the elected official has basically come back and said, Yogi, we're gonna to have to agree to disagree on this one. Uh, and often enough, there are others um, in the room who will come back and say, he's not with us. Um, we're gonna to have to figure out a way to come back and go support a supporter. Um, can you share with me, if, what, what are your thoughts? Do you deal with those that don't agree with you even more? Or do you cut your losses and move on? and say, you know what, we're gonna go support the other guy. So again, I'm speaking strictly from my own perspective and with my own elected officials, because this will vary. And that's why relationship building is important. For us, we will work with the person that we only agree with 5% of the time, even if we disagree with them 5, 95% of the time. My member of Congress, Scott Peters, will work with anybody on the issues in which they're willing to engage. So you should get an understanding and, and study voting records, study statements that are made, get a feel for whether the elected official that you're trying to work with is open to opposing ideas or it's just they're gonna vote party line like Puneet brought up earlier and they're just doing whatever the party might want them to do. So it's important to understand that dynamic. The other thing that's important to understand in the context of the conversation is I'll meet with anybody. And the, the key is that it's all about perspective. So we might disagree on this issue. So you bring up some really great points. I respect your points, Yogi. We agree to disagree on this issue. But as we mentioned before, there are hundreds of votes that are taken by any given elected official or dozens of votes, depending on what you're looking at at the, at the local level. So whereas we might agree on the issue that you came to speak to me about today, there's no way for you to know that there's not gonna be an issue tomorrow that we do agree on. And that's why it's so critical to maintain a line of respect when you're having these conversations is because the world can change in a snap. Um, a tweet goes out and all of a sudden your day changes. A statement is made and your entire day changes. So just because you disagree today on the issues of today, doesn't mean that you're gonna disagree tomorrow on the issues of tomorrow. And it's critical to keep that in mind when you're engaging in conversation. Now, the last thing that I was is, if you disagree yesterday, today and tomorrow, then we're starting to see a, a trend there. And there might not be a way to build that relationship you might need a replacement, but you have to have an open mind. Remember, you know, you may have disagreed yesterday. You do agree today. Look at those things. Is it a trend or is it a one-off thing? Make sure to keep that in mind when thinking about how your interactions are going to go. Great. I mean, I'm going to ask you down to a more granular level. You were supporting a candidate um, for governor and you were his API advisor. Um, you know, um, he probably brought you in for a reason. And, and what were the landmines that he was asking you to have him traverse in this process of running through a primary and eventually as an elected governor? I want to touch upon what Jason also mentioned. It's all about relationship, folks. And, and having a relationship with a member of Congress is so important. And, and Jason has, has given us such a great perspective of this member of Congress. But I'm going to speak from a candidate we just don't have enough time when you're a candidate. You're always focusing on raising money and, and, and knowing the issue so that you're able to articulate that message in 30 seconds to 60 seconds. The second thing is your confidence. You're always confident. You're surrounded by your uh, professionals. You know, the guy who does messaging is the one who's going to do the messaging part. The guy, let's say, is known for South Asia, will advise you on what to say on South Asia or Ukraine issue, or you have a general sense on things or health issues. So usually a candidate is prepared, but he's prepared to give only what he call is the headline and few more things. And then he'll basically walk the path, the tightrope where he doesn't fall off or doesn't slip. That's the thing. Uh, 
and 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 I urge. In fact, I even uh, one of the groups wanted me to host an event, and I said, let's have an event with members of Congress. But before that, let's have a nice event for the people who work for the members of Congress, because they are the ones who are really helping him, and they are the ones who work long hours and and make that member of Congress look very very good. So I, I always commend that hardworking folks in the office. Uh, and and now your question. When uh, Youngkin won the nomination um, and he picked up the phone, we had a 35 to 45 minutes conversation. And I said, I want to be one of your generals uh, because we had campaigned for almost 10 months together. We were every, you know, every week, few week, a few events, going from one county to the other, uh, making our spiel and telling us why we are the ones to be uh, their choice. Um, and, and we had built a relationship, even though he was running for governor and I was running for lieutenant governor. I found him to be a remarkable man, such clean, and you could feel that he was going to win uh, because he had all the right issues. And he was very savvy, even though he's a business person who had become a politician, but we, I saw how he really changed himself and stayed on message. That's very important for a candidate. But the landmines I felt was that um, our community, um, the predominantly Democrat, and, and, and so be it, how do we move this community to see why it is important for them to vote for conservative uh, candidate? And that opportunity came when Terry McAuliffe said that parents have no right to choose in the education of their, system, of their kids. That was a huge remarkable opportunity and we all passed on it. And luckily for me, I had already taken the critical race theory issue. I was one of the first person who took the critical race theory and I didn't want to be boxed. I completely believe in merit-based education. Because if you're an A plus kid and doesn't really matter where you come from, you're an American, you should be able to go to the magnet schools. And that's the reason I think the education brought the large Asian American community. And I saw a large number of Indian Americans coming out and playing an important role in this election. And not only Indian Americans or Asian Americans, but I saw African Americans, Black Americans. I saw Hispanics looking at that. And that's the reason why Youngkin won so effectively and successfully in this. So, my pitfall is that when I was looking to have Indian Americans to, to come or Asian Americans to support, I didn't, couldn't find people to make phone calls. I have to commend a, a Hindu group out of New Jersey. Again, they're also part of Virginia who made phone calls for us. I really commend them for doing it. And no, nobody would ever go and do the door, door knocking. And, and that's the biggest frustration is everybody wants this governor to now show up at their events, but when we needed them, none of these association or groups, because first they never thought we were gonna win. It's apparently Virginia is a blue state, but that's what Jason said. You never know the world can change in a matter of a second, like just one tweet or one statement can really take a campaign uh, towards nosedive. So what I request our communities, and I have said that in my, my previous ask, please do door knocking, make phone calls, even if it's 30 minutes, you have no idea, folks, for, uh, for any campaign, having hands, and especially we Indian Americans are all ambassadors of our great nation we come from. We are the best ambassadors of our faith, of our culture, of uh, the vast values that we have added to this great nation. So it's important when an Indian American, because our names are very different and, and our faith is very different. So it's important that when we actively participate, it's, it shows, it shines. And that's what I'm requesting all our folks to do is make my life easier when I choose to run for office or I'm tasked to help uh, any other candidate. And that's what we also do is helping to build coalitions because coalitions are very important. There's a Hindu American coalition, there is Sikh American coalition, there's a Muslim American coalition. And then you have a coalition of people who are runners, walkers, gardeners, uh, whatever, or yoga, uh, you know, yoga workers. So idea is to, build a strong coalition and show a force of strength that this coalition is not going to can tip the outcome of the election. Because as Jason would agree, now these elections are so tight and the numbers are so close that every vote counts. And that's the reason why it's important the Indian American community plays an active involved role in this process. I couldn't agree with you more, Puneet. The margin Hi, Yogi, can I just add one quick thing? Absolutely. Go ahead. Just one sentence. And I think it's, I always remind people about this. Someone's going to get elected. Yeah. Just remember that someone's going to get elected. So whether you like both candidates, whether you dislike both candidates, 
one of them is going to win. So unfortunately these days, in a good case, you might be selecting the better of two goods. Unfortunately, it seems to be more common where you're looking at the lesser of two evils, but there can be a significant difference in the lesser of two bad candidates. And this is why voting is so important is whether you vote or not, one of them is going to win. So your vote, does, your vote will make a difference no matter what, because somebody is going to win that election, whether you participate or not. That's awesome, Jason, thank you very much. I think the margin of victory uh, is becoming evidently clear. Elections are razor thin these days and everybody can help make a difference. You know, some simple examples I can share with you. There's one person in this community that everybody goes and talks to for whatever they need. And, and I would always come back and say, you know what, this guy doesn't raise any money. He doesn't write any major checks. Public information, right? You can see on FPPC filings or your local jurisdictions who's given some money. And, and five out of the elected officials that I just talked to, I said, I don't know why this guy is being courted by everybody. And this is, you, know, you know what, every time I run for office, he basically has a coffee in his backyard, very informal. He gets a Starbucks coffee and, and he gets these um, $5 cookie bags. And, and, and he says every time he brings 50, 75 people from his neighborhood, have a coffee. And he says, you know what? Those 75 votes are a whole lot more precious than the $2,000 he's going to ever raise for me. Amazing. So that, that's really the story about <laughs> engagement at the lowest granular level. You know, don't wait for somebody else to come back and invite you to a big fundraiser. You know, as the observations. Now, money matters. Don't get me wrong. Money is the mother's milk of politics. Um, but if given a choice between money and people, they would probably want both. But if given a choice, I think votes can make a difference because 50, 100 votes can make a big difference in a city council election. So, Jason and Puit, now the conversation comes down to uh, what I think will be a conversation that's come up a lot. And I've seen a lot of questions posed on farm policy or objections to a rhetoric of a certain member of Congress. But let's talk a little bit about uh, observations about uh, a community that I think has had a dramatic uh, and very significant political influence in American politics. Um, and, and Jason, this question I'd ask is, I, I know you happen to be Jewish American, um, you happen to be somebody that's engaged in American politics for a long time. But the Jewish American political voice in America has had a significant, significant impact uh, to the point that today it's probably considered as a force du jour in American politics. Um, but less interested in knowing uh, how important the force is, but can you tell us, Jason and I, like Benita as an observer, for you to come back and chime in as well, but the Israeli American political voice, how did it start? How did they get to where they are? And what should we emulate? Vote. I, I know it sounds simple, but vote. Jewish Americans vote at the highest rate of any demographic of group in the United States. Consistently, 80 to 90% of all Jewish Americans vote. That's the number one thing. And candidates know that. We were talking about how close a lot of these elections are. You might have 100 Jewish Americans that live in your district, but probably 90 to 95 of them are gonna vote. So candidates know Jewish Americans vote, that matters. So that's the number one thing is candidates know Jewish Americans vote on both sides, Democrats and Republicans. And that's the other point. We have Jewish Americans on both sides and they make their voices heard. So the Jewish American voice in the Republican party is very strong and they have organizations specifically devoted to them on the Republican side. And the Jewish American voice on the Democratic side is very important, and they have organizations devoted to that. What's fascinating, though, is consistently 70 to 80 percent of Jewish Americans vote Democratic, while 20 to 30 percent of Jewish Americans vote Republican. But you don't see the Republican Party giving up on the Jewish American vote, even though consistently 70 to 80 percent vote Democrat, because that's still 20 to 30 percent that's available to them. And it can vary too by individual candidates. So that's just looking at the party line. But if you look at individual candidates, that support can be very different. And that's the mindset that the Indian American community should use. The Indian American community, one, we have to vote in greater numbers. It's public information who votes. So we don't know who you vote for, but we know whether you're voting or not. So it's really important for everybody to vote because when people start seeing that your community is voting, it now becomes more 
important for candidates to engage with your community. So that's the first one, as I mentioned. And the second one is, it's okay. It's okay to have Indian Americans that are strong, vocal, conservative Republicans and let their voice be heard in the Republican Party. And it's important to have strong, vocal, progressive, democratic Indian Americans and their voices heard within the Democratic Party. That's a good thing because it ensures both parties are aware of your concerns. One thing that the Jewish community takes as seriously as anything else is one, Israel's not safe, and two, Jewish Americans are not safe if we don't have both Democrat and Republican friends. In order to ensure our safety and security, and in order to ensure the long-term safety and security of the state of Israel, we must have supporters on both sides of the aisle. And why is that? And it's because the political pendulum swings. It swings one way and it swings the other. We had President Obama, then we had President Trump. So it is critical as a minority and as a growing minority to understand that. And the Jews take it very seriously. You will rarely see Jews demonizing each other simply as Jews that support the opposing party. Now, we, we did have some of that within the last few years where the tensions have escalated because of the partisanship, but it is very rare that you will see Jews attacking Jews simply because they're Jewish and saying that that's contrary to Jewish values that you vote for one party or the other. It's contrary to Jewish values for you to support any given candidate. So I would urge you to vote. I would urge you to celebrate the fact that there are Indian Americans that are Democrats and there are Indian Americans that are Republicans. And this is the most important piece of all. You should never attack somebody as an Indian American or as a Hindu American based on their support for any given candidate because that only brings down the community overall. You should never accuse their vote for a Democrat or Republican being in opposition to Hindu values or towards Indian American values. It should focus on different area differences that you might have, but never demean them as a Hindu American or as an Indian American, because um, that brings down the whole community. Got it. Neith, love to hear your thoughts as well as an observation of the influence of the Israel American uh, community, but also in the governor's election, how you as API Indian American had to work with Jewish leaders to get your candidate elected. Well, you know, uh, it's an open fact that we Indian Americans walk the path of how the Jewish Americans have done so effectively well. I, I think our DNA is very similar. We want our kids to be doctors and lawyers and successful at every front. But I'm gonna say one more thing, not only they vote, but they're also in key states and they all vote as, as, a, as a block in most, most cases. Uh, we've seen that in Florida and New York, of course. But I think the very important thing is that the Jewish uh, people, ever since they found the homeland, they were very proud of that. And you know, one reliable ally our country has is the Jewish state. And I'm gonna commend President Trump on taking on the Abram Accord and finding so solution to that for the last 60 plus years, nobody could find that solution. It was President Trump who came up with the Abram Accord. And today we see the largest Israeli investments in Dubai. And, they, and, and we have seen how the, the whole game has changed between the Middle East. And that is what is important is, as Jason said, it's all about dialogue. It's all the pendulum swings, getting engaged. But I also believe that we are going through an identity crisis. I don't want us Indian Americans or the Hindu Americans to be in a bracket because our numbers are not very large and it's not gonna be that strong. Because one, we are not from the Christian faith. We are not from the Abrahamic faith. And I keep coming to say that it's important. And that's the reason why Abraham Accord, if you look at it, the fundamentals is so important. And that's the reason why I request my folks here that get out of this hyper nation of Indian American. What's important for us is that we are proud Americans who pay large amount of taxes. Our kids excel, our business leader excels, our community leader excels, and we have a heritage which is thousands of years old. And we have a lot to contribute to the American uh, uh, fabric. So this is what we need to do. So coming back to the point is that I, I love my Jewish brothers. I have close friends, my, my Jewish, Peter Goldman, who is, happens to be Jewish, also is my uncle to my kids. And every Christmas, he spends with us. So uh, I, I think the Jewish community, we have a lot to learn from them. 
And at the same time, now we are also teaching other communities who are trying to be like Indian Americans because they see us excelling and, and succeeding. And that's the reason we have to throw down the rope and teach the game or how the politics is played to the other communities. Got it. So that's phenomenal. I'd like to make an observation, um, Jason and Puneet, and thank you. This has been a phenomenal conversation thus far. It's been simplistic, but there have been some nuggets of details, which I think people will be able to find helpful as they articulate their own political journey. Um, an observation. The Jewish American community has traversed domestic issues and in foreign policy issues extremely, extremely successfully, uh, while others have not. Um, and it's remarkable trait how they have, uh, but I believe, and, and Jason, I, I say this with a compliment, um, you played the long game. Um, this was years in the making, it didn't happen overnight. Um, you forged broad relationships in both the Democrats and the Republican party. And I think um, one of the things that you've done is you've given a candidate a pass. And when I say a pass, um, on a tough vote, some votes it's not, this is the way it's gonna be, but on some tough votes, you've given them a pass and allowed them to nurture themselves and build relationships. And you've educated them a whole lot way along the process to the point that they're considered as allies and friends. Um, so we could have a conversation about the vibrancy of the Israeli-American political journey in America, which I think began 50 years ago. Um, but, you know, we have so much in common, and I think uh, we need to lose to the fact that our values bind us. Uh, there are issues on a geo-terror that bind us even more. And third is this very old notion of the fact that if we contribute to a society, we should be able to have a stake at the table and not be demonized. Uh, by others, and in some instances, those that may espouse a different political value. So we're down to the last few moments, Kandaraji, probably we have another five or 10 minutes, I would say. But um, I would ask a question that um, would probably help put in my mind uh, what often I've seeked for answers. And I would think that there are many people in this room that would be interested to hear that as well. Often I found that in politics, the best way for somebody to box you in is to call you a fringe? Um, it's a tough question, and it's probably a tough answer um, as well, but how do you make sure you don't become a fringe in the first place in American politics? Because somebody told me, and I shared these personal stories, right? Um, having a conversation with a couple of um, members of Congress when I was working on an uh, issue when I was the president of the Indian American Forum for Political Education, I see Dr. Japra is here as well, he was a former president of the Indian American Forum for Political Education. So our work was advocacy. And we were uh, focusing on, at that time, a seat for India on the Security Council. And very, very quickly, uh, we got boxed in. And then we recovered and said, no, this is not gonna work. So we evolved a political strategy and we got ourselves to um, not being called a fringe in American politics. But how do you make sure you never get there and if you do get there for any reason, um, how do you get out of it? So I'll like, start with you, Jason. Okay. Um, so for, I, I've got a couple of things on this one and I'll go back to Yogi actually to your previous point. So the main thing is we need to be honest and you should not be afraid of being honest. Um, you know who you are. You should not allow others to tell your story. And that's something that plays into the Jewish community as well that the Indian American and the Hindu American community should remember is don't let others tell the story of who you are. So if somebody calls you a racist, I get called a racist all the time. It doesn't bother me. I know I'm not a racist. So they can say whatever they want. That's the good or bad or free speech, depending on how you look at it, is the idea that anybody can accuse anybody of being a racist. Anybody can accuse anybody of being on the fringe. In fact, we have accusations running around right now about who might be a baby killer and who isn't a baby killer. Um, I know who I am. I know what I believe. So you could call me whatever names you want. It's not going to phase me and the morals and values that I know that I stand for. That's the first thing. The other thing, particularly when it comes to balancing the extremes is understand that the world is not black and white. And there are no political topics that you can paint black and white. It's just not. There are, okay, so there are very few exceptions to that that do get a little bit 
darker and a little bit lighter. But in general, there's always nuance when it comes to politics. So I'll give you a good example, and I'll be very specific. Um, Pune brought up President Trump and the Abraham Accords. So the Jewish community, for the most part, celebrated the Abraham Accords. We thought that that was a really good thing. However, by signing Abraham Accords, we don't excuse President Trump from trafficking in anti-Semitic tropes, which he did over and over and over again. He said any Democrat that votes for, any Jew that votes Democrat is a traitor to Israel. That's anti-Semitism. He said Jews only vote based on their pocketbooks. That's anti-Semitism. So as a majority of the Jewish community, we're not going to excuse President Trump because he signed the Abraham Accords while he's running around promoting anti-Semitic tropes. And we get that. We can celebrate the Abraham Accords, and we still call President Trump out when he's espousing anti-Semitic views. And that's the key thing to consider in the context of being accused of being on the fringe or not. Oftentimes when you get accused of being an extremist or a fringe, it's based on a specific topic. They're trying to tie you just to that one topic without looking at everything else that you're doing as an elected official. And you need to remember that there is no elected official that only votes on a singular topic. Every single elected official votes on multiple topics. So I'll give you an example from the Indian American community to think about. We separate out domestic and foreign policy. I'll go back to President Trump. President Trump, considered a strong ally of President Modi, helped build up a relationship with President Modi working on free trade, working on improving the military with India. Those I think we can acknowledge are positives. President Trump at the same time shut down immigration, not just illegal immigration, President Trump shut down legal immigration. There are hundreds of thousands of Indian Americans who are not able to get their green cards because President Trump wasn't processing their applications. There are hundreds of thousands of Indian Americans, and this is a particular interest of importance in San Diego to us, who were not able to get their work permits because President Trump wouldn't process work permits. So while he talked about illegal immigration, he also shut down legal migration. So you might like his foreign policy, but the reality is that his domestic policy was extremely harmful to the Indian American community. And those distinctions are important to be made because again, it all goes back to the world is not black and white. So when somebody tries to paint you as an extremist, when somebody name calls you, you know who you are, you know what you stand for. They're trying to focus on a singular issue. The world is much wider than a singular issue. And we should remember that. And you should also remember that when evaluating specific candidates. You might like them for one position, but don't forget about every other vote that they're taking and how that imp impacts you and whether that aligns with your morals and your values. Jason, that is so remarkable, man. You have, I can see you've been at this for a long time. <laughs> you have been able to impart wisdom and guidance along the way that I think is just, it's not only astute, but it's pragmatic, it's real. And, and you're speaking to us today as a friend would speak to a friend. And that I think is a valuable trait. And Jason, I just you know commend you for that. Puneet, certainly love to hear your observations about this as well. Uh, carefully tread, uh, certainly it's a difficult topic to answer sometimes when you are one of your own, but uh, your perspective would be invaluable as well, Puneet, so. You see, Washington is all about defining you and the storytellers are the ones who define you. So as Jason said, who's building your narrative? Who's telling your story? And what we tend to do is we do not hire advocacy groups. We don't hire the mainstream people to tell your story. And we are very happy to tell our stories which are gonna be heard in India, which really doesn't matter to the mainstream politics here in the United States, because our attention span is 15 seconds to 20 seconds at the same time our friends and family are sending all the stupid WhatsApp messages that we are more keen to look at because this is politics as it's consuming. So you have to be emotionally and passionate about it. And, 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 and the community it is, uh, is at a very important juncture because I'm glad we're having this conversation. I'm gonna say that very openly folks, the higher we go up, the bigger the target we become. And that's very important. And we are now a target because we are the ire on the terms of, and I'm not just talking, as Jason said, President Trump, did this, did that, fine, great. But at the same time, that happens on both sides of the aisle. And that's what is important is open your checkbooks, participate, contribute, activate, and tell your own story. And have people who are already in the realm 
to to give you advice. Look, oh, Benito's a he's a Republican, and and oh, he is a Sikh. I'm a proud Indian American, but most importantly, I'm an American. When anybody is going to look at you and me, they'll see brown, and they say, well, you know, where is he from? Well, he's from India. I'm the pride of India, and so are you. The idea is to hold hands and and be a resource and support to each other. And that was very unfortunate. Uh, you know, Yogi, when I ran for office, a lot of mainstream folks supported me. Very few of my Indian American friends wrote big ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollar check, and I thank them for doing that. But it's important, folks. You cannot have a narrative without spending money, because as we say, if the tree falls in the forest, nobody hears it. Nobody's going to hear about it. So that's the reason. I'm glad we had today about thirty plus people here, and 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 I wish we have more of these conversations with the larger community. We have a strong 2.6 million people, and I'm going to come to a very important point. When you talk about the fringe, the whole thing can change. If the Indian American just in Virginia can unite and can change the outcome of election in Northern Virginia, which is loud in Fairfax, Prince William County, Virginia Beach area, and the Richmond area, this community can make the next president of the United States. When I say make, and help to elect. We can be wooed by the people because this community is, not going, to, is going to come out and vote in a block. That's my goal that we become a powerhouse. We become the Achilles heel that basically votes in the interest of this great nation. And yes, is uh, strong US-India ties as part of that equation? Hell yes. And I don't care whoever is in power. People of India are very smart and they will choose the right prime minister who they feel is best for them, who's gonna navigate their country. And look at us, why are we successful here? The people elected, the, the people of India really must have done a great job that we are here today as, I, I would say, outliers today. In every field, you, you hear, you read Wall Street Journal, there is not a single Indian American CEO who's not quoted for what the good work and great work they're doing. And that's what we should be proud about, guys. But now it's a time to open your checkbook. If this 2.6 million Indian Americans who are citizens can write a $10 check, that's 26 million. And that 26 million, you take 250,000 to half a million dollars in different political races across the nation. Guess what? You're just flexing a muscle. That's just $10 that 2.6 million or 26 million can do. Folks, Honest. we can make a big, huge difference. And, and we have a responsibility for that because we, are, we have come from democracy and we want to promote democracy. Thank you for having me. No, this has been a great conversation. Um, this is probably going to be the simplest question for each one of you, and I'll, I'll leave it for you. Okay, so for both Jason and Puneet, for the Indian American diaspora here in the United States, which party is better, the Republican Party or the Democratic Party? Go at it, guys. So Puneet, let's start with you, why the Republican Party is good. And Jason, then you can come back and tell us why the Democratic Party is good. And I ask this question with one goal in mind. Everybody in this room will come back and say, you don't always have to agree with what they say, but they know what they're talking about. It's important to look at a candidate in the context of the totality of who they are. Not one issue, not two issues. Work with them, mold them, encourage them, invest in their future. And it's beautiful how these candidates build friendships. And once these friendships are forged, policy making becomes a whole lot easier. So Puneet, go at it, followed by Jason. Well, thank you. I, I believe in the conservative principles of the Republican values is because I'm an, I believe in individual liberty, in the pursuit of happiness, as our founding fathers did, is to go out and write our own destiny. And that's what I have done and that's what most of the people who are here and most of the immigrants who come to this great nation and one before me and the ones who are gonna come after us, after me. So the goal here is that the individual liberty excites me a lot. At the same time, I'm a firm believer of uh, less regulation, less taxes, less red tape. Free market enterprise is what I believe in. And that's what we all Indian Americans or uh, Americans thrive on. Look at how Elon Musk, who is South African, came here and has created like sensational, not only on Twitter, but all around what he's doing. We are all outliers who come to this great nation. So that's the reason I believe in legal immigration. I believe in there's a path for us and that is what most Indian Americans want to come here legally. 
ethically based on education. And I also believe in solid merit-based education and lies that, oh, you're an African-American or you're an Hispanic-American, so you should be given the quota system. We left that behind. So the education system, and I believe strong defense. I was a very firm believer of peace through strength. That was President Trump's motto. Because we can see if we falter, the whole equation in the world falls apart. And we can see right now, I'm not gonna say anything against Jason's great president, but look at the disaster we had in, in Afghanistan. It's gonna basically open the entire uh, floodgates of terrorism all across the Middle East to Japan. And, it's, and we will start seeing what's gonna happen. Now the opium trade is, is at the highest now. Narcotics, which has besieged our great nation from Mexico. At the same time, we're seeing what's happening in Ukraine. At the same time now, the whole shift is happening because Finland and Sweden are now joining NATO. So what, if, if Biden would have taken those action, Putin would not have attacked. And what we do with Putin is a very direct message to China because our main, problem is China, not only for the Americans, for the rest of the world, and most importantly on India. That's the problem, guys. And we have not talked anything about the coronavirus. We can sue them. We can have all these businesses get out of China into other allies. So, I, I, so I'm a Republican because I can choose any faith I can choose to be. If I choose to believe in God, great. If not, I don't choose to believe in God, I can do that. That's what the conservative values are to me. And most importantly, I'm, I believe in life. And right now, Roe versus Wade is a very important issue. We, I believe and choose life any day. My youngest child was born with a heart defect or was told it's gonna to be a Down syndrome. We could have aborted the child. We didn't, we chose life because it's very precious. It's a gift from God. So folks, um, Yogi will share my number and it's been an honor and a pleasure. But that's the reason my passion and emotion comes from being a proud conservative and a proud Republican. And that's the reason you're, when you're a candidate and when you are a person who believes in these things, it's very easy, it flows naturally. So all Indian Americans believe in paying less taxes and having more businesses. So you should be all Republicans. <laughs> Jason, let's make our club back round. <laughs> So I'm a Democrat and I'm a proud Democrat. And I say this specifically about the political parties because I've reiterated over and over that the individual candidates are important to get to know. But if we look at the political parties, to me, it's the most simple choice ever. One party is about hypocrites and liars. And I don't say that lightly from a party perspective. And the other party is honest. So what the Republican party does repeatedly is they support one position when Republicans are in power, and they, they oppose that exact same position as soon as they lose power. So I'll give you a few examples of why the Republicans are so terrible. They talk about limited government and complain about the deficit for eight years under President Obama. Trump tax cuts, the scam, increased our deficit by $2 trillion. Now under Biden, they complain that COVID increased the deficit by $2 trillion. The Trump tax cuts increased the deficit by $2 trillion, strictly Republicans. What happened to fiscal responsibility? There was none as soon as they were in power. They only cared about fiscal responsibility when Democrats were in power. The other one that we'll bring up when it comes to the Republicans, they're yelling and screaming right now about Ukraine and Biden. Trump blocked US assistance to Ukraine because he wanted help defeating Joe Biden. When did any Republican say anything about President Trump when he was blocking US assistance to Ukraine? None of them said anything. So to me, it's clear, you have one party of hypocrites. They hold themselves to one standard and they hold Democrats to another. And I don't support hypocrisy. Now on the Democratic side, at least we're honest. We believe in taxing big corporations and taxing those that have been successful and have the means to support themselves in order to benefit those that are in less fortunate and may need some form of assistance. So corporations like Amazon, like Google, like Facebook should pay their fair share in taxes just like most Americans do. And they're not right now. We need to fix that. There are people that land on hard times. COVID was a big influencer of that. The housing market collapse was an influencer of that. The government should be there to help those that are genuinely in need. The Democratic Party is proud. We tax and we help. So we might not agree on how much to tax or how much to help, but that is what the Democratic Party stands for. 
The Republican Party has just gone off. They stand for one thing when Democrats are in power and then stand for a completely different one when Republicans in power. And we say enough of the hypocrisy. If you're going to say something when a Democrat is in power, you better say that same thing when a Republican is in power. So hold your Republicans accountable and vote Democrat, because at least we're honest about what we're going to do. Wow. Love it. This is exactly what partisan <laughs> politics is all about. But at the end of the day, I would probably come back and say, as I know Beneath well, and, and Jason, I've gotten to know you in some of our conversations that we've had off late. But what binds you is you love America. You love this country. And you love what it stands for. And, and every single day we thrive to make America a better country. And as an Indian American, I'm a US citizen, but I'm proud of my origins. I'm proud of India. And how India looks every day defines um, the questions I have to answer in my political friends and circles when they ask me questions. There have been a couple of questions um, that have come in this uh, chat session today. And some of the questions were about specific members of Congress and what are we gonna do about them? But I'll pose a question. Uh, one of the last questions came in from uh, somebody that wrote about the fact that they had two specific examples of how they supported a candidate because they felt that that candidate was better for India. And then uh, there seems to be some betrayal that's been felt because they may have made statements or comments that were inconsistent with what they believe uh, a candidate should be. Um, and I, I can see the anger sometimes can be um, valid because you invested in their race, you walked for them, and all of a sudden they said something that hit to the core of who you are. But Jason, you said you have to look at a candidate and its totality, uh, not one or two issues. But can you shed light? You've probably been in these situations where somebody supported you and you've had to take a position because of reasons. Uh, sometimes it's the nuances of the district. Sometimes it's the nuances of the party leadership and how they want to whip on a certain vote. All realities of politics is not black and white. It's shades of gray at times, but it's progress and moving forward. So Jason, what would you say to those who may feel that they've been disappointed by candidates who they may have given everything for. They were their hopes and aspirations for everything they believed in those people. What would you say to them? So it's a great question, Yogi, and I think it's a good way to, to kind of wind things down too, because we brought up the Jewish community earlier. Um, I've been doing this for over a decade now, and no point in my entire career has ever been more difficult when we were going through the Iran nuclear agreement negotiations by President Obama. And in fact, it's coming back now with President Biden. And I bring that up because in the context of the comment that was made earlier, and when you feel strongly and you feel disappointed in what an elected official did, there's a key thing that you need to ask, why? Why did the elected official take the position that they took? Why did the elected official make the statement that they made? And the reason that the why is so critical is because when we were having the Iran nuclear agreement debate, the Jewish community was extremely split. But what ultimately happened is the vote on the Iran nuclear agreement actually wasn't about the Iran nuclear agreement. That entire debate was so politicized that it became a vote of, do you support President Obama or do you oppose President Obama? It wasn't about the deal itself. President Obama was overwhelmingly elected twice, not once, but twice. This was in the second term. President Obama received over 80% of the vote of Jewish Americans. When that debate became about Obama, it didn't matter what the deal said. It didn't matter what the impact of the deal on Israel was or on Iran was. We were voting on Obama. And that was done by the Republican Party. The Republican Party made it a metric. If you support the deal, you support Obama. That was their choice. It wasn't about the deal. So when you disagree with a position that's being taken, remember to ask yourself why. Are there partisan considerations because somebody is personally attacking Joe Biden? And as a Democrat, I'm going to defend Joe Biden. Whether I agree with his policies or not, do not attack him as a person. When you call him a baby killer, that is a personal attack. When you say that President Obama, that President Biden is you know, supporting Nazis in Ukraine, that's a personal attack. I'm going to take that personally. That is not a policy debate. So when you hear of elected officials that you really invested in 
and they make a decision that you agree with, ask them why. Every elected official should be able to tell you why they took the position that they took. If they can't answer that question, your feelings are, well, are deserved and you should react accordingly. But if they can answer the why, you should take that answer very seriously in how you think about the what. Thank you, Jason. Yogi, I think this is a maturity of the community from taking just pictures to getting into the ask. You have to be very specific and clear about the ask. And when I do advocacy work, I usually have my client or what's your objective? You have to define your objective very clearly. And, and, and Jason is right. There is a reason when you ask why, but at the same time, are you very clear with what your ask is? It just can't be vague and, and, and all over the board. You want to vote or support on certain things, or you want to have briefing or, or hearing about certain things. So you have to be very clear about your ask. And then if the candidate did not really walk the walk and do the do, then you simply say, well, maybe he has a valid reason. And then you go back to him, say, you, you know, can you explain and expand on that? And that's where the relationship comes. But what happens is that when people believe they've written checks or they've taken pictures or he's my friend, it's people like Jason and myself who've been briefed that, oh, this guy is, he's, he's this and he's that. And that relationship, it takes time to nurture uh, relationships. And at the same time, people have to trust you. They have to know your core. I'm being very blunt here, if, and I'm also choosing my words very carefully. So folks, from getting, taking pictures and writing checks and say, oh, we have this thing, you know, it's not there. It's about getting to know the staffers and where he's come from and why he did what he did. It's important. Mm -hmm. And it's more important that sometimes it's a, such a heavy lift. And that lift, like for example, in some immigration issues are a heavy lift. And if you think that lift, I'm, I'm gonna share some number that, oh, we can get this thing done for $2 million. No, it's not 2 million. That is gonna be 10 million. So either you're naive or you're ignorant, but also it tells you the maturity of the people you work with. It's all knowing the maze of Washington. And, and I can guarantee you 98% of the people don't know and don't understand. It's such a chaos here. <laughs> so, but but it's, it's, it is a coordinated chaos. That's great. We've already gone over our time today. This has been, we could have this conversation another hour if you really wanted to, but Jason, we've already extended uh, the time that we had asked you to be present. We're gracious for your friendship. We're gracious for your participation today. Um, that means the world to us. Punita, thank you for rising to the call of duty, coming on board. And, and you know, we, we spoke amongst friends. We spoke about those that care deeply about this country. Um, they care deeply about the US India partnership. Uh, we care deeply about the fact that it is gonna be one of the most flowering partnerships of the 21st century. We have a role to play. Uh, we'll build our allyship uh, with communities of all types. Uh, recently, somebody had shared with me, uh, Yogi, one of the coalitions that you need to uh, build is coalitions with the African-American community. And I said, why? And they said, because they share a love and bond of Gandhi and Martin Luther King and you share some values, build relationships, don't take them for granted or don't exclude them. Include them in your dialogue, uh, include them in your participation of your advocacy. You might find common boundaries. You might find issues on which you'll have to tread carefully, but better start now than having to reclaim it uh, down the road. So this is all about what politics is, building friendships, building relationships. Um, the primary is June. Nothing that can come out of this other than write a check, make a phone call, pay attention, show up at their coffees, um, go pay attention, sign up for newsletters, hear the positions, um, be on guard, go to town halls, ask questions, uh, forge the relationships. Um, and you don't have to be the one, have a group of a dozen people that go build relationships and have these meetings so you can come back and note share, mind share, disseminate, share the information. If you meet a candidate, come back and say, I had a healthy conversation. I got to know a whole lot more about them. Don't get caught in the rhetoric. Um, WhatsApp is good and WhatsApp is bad. But opinions are a dime a dozen. But let's get fact-based information on the table in order for us to become the effective voice that we can become. And with that, Jason, Puneet, and all of you in this room today, thank you very much for being a part of the diaspora, the FIDS 
uh, discussion series. Um, and thank you for that. And with that, Khanda Rauji, I, I bring this back to you for helping us have this conversation today and your leadership on the creation of Foundation of Indian Diaspora Studies. So back to you, Khanda Rauji. Thanks, Yogi, for the uh, marvelous uh, uh, panel uh, moderation. And uh, thanks, uh, Jason and Puneet, uh, uh, very insightful and wonderful, straight uh, uh, as guidance as well as the comments, really. Uh, this will be uh, very helpful for uh, the audience, uh, which is attending from all over the US, from Virginia to San Diego to Phoenix, uh, Chicago. I see the people, all the four, uh, not just four, but I see from uh, Atlanta also. So all the corners of the uh, United States. As uh, Puneet uh, said, right, this, uh, this is our historic uh, responsibility to create this uh, political uh, influence. In this today's discussions, uh, Jason called out some of the steps that be engaged, uh, vote, uh, engage with the elected officials. Uh, FIDS uh, is going to campaign for uh, no voter uh, uh, voting participation. We need to increase the Indo-Americans and Hindu-Americans, uh, Sikh-Americans uh, voting in this uh, no process. We need to make sure that uh, we are engaged. Uh, we contribute uh, no monetarily. We also become foot soldiers. Uh, uh, so we'll be creating that awareness campaign. Uh, feeds uh, as a think tank uh, uh, go through the voting uh, records uh, and the policy matters which are related to India, Indian diasporas and US-India relations. So we'll be presenting some of the fi uh, findings, uh, not for the primary, but actually when the uh, main uh, uh, elections happen. So we'll be presenting that uh, for Indo-Americans to uh, consider. Uh, finally, I think the long term, as uh, Jason mentioned, that uh, we need to uh, actively participate in this uh, uh, election processes. So FIDS has the internship pro programs and workshops to increase such kind of participations. So with this, I would like to uh, conclude today's session. This will be posted on our uh, uh, YouTube channel and uh, also uh, look forward for ongoing uh, series in this uh, respect. Uh, we'll have uh, uh, from now till November continuous events related to the elections and uh, look forward your active participation. With that, we'll stop the recordings and we'll keep the session open for informal discussion if you want to discuss anything uh, informally. Thank you.